And now, please welcome Amber Buker, founder and CEO, Totem, and Jim Castleberry, CEO and co-founder, Known Holdings. Well, hey, Jim. Good, good morning, Amber. How are you? It's so I'm good to meet really you. really well. Have we ever met before? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. I'm excited to chat with you today Absolutely. in front of all of our friends. Yeah, you, you know, this is always part of the, the good thing and the uh, problem is that we, in these types of environments, we seem to be talking to the choir, right? But... Um, with us having the diversity of relationships, both academics, funders, innovators, solvers, all in the same room, you know, for us to be able to be aligned on how we do this and how we move forward. Um, why don't we start off with you sharing what you do at Totem and what have been some of your experiences and. Re, in, in getting started and raising um, all of the chaos that is going <laughs> on in our uh, marketplace right now. So yeah. how it's impacted you. Well, I love to start out, if you don't mind indulging me in my native language, Halito sa hochifo ya Amber Buker, chata siya hoki, Tulsa amitili. Hello, my name is Amber Buker. I am Choctaw, I am from Tulsa. And I like to start that way, not to like brag, I am not a good native speaker, I'm just <laughs> learning, but um, we believe in our indigenous communities that um, a lot of people believe that when you speak our language, you breathe life into it. And so um, I just like to start that way and like, <sighs> breathe life into this conversation too. Um, so a little bit about my background. I am Choctaw, as I mentioned. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I live most of my life there. And it's a really special place to grow up because there are 39 different federally recognized tribes based there. And over half of the state is reservation land. So I grew up in a place where it was not uncommon to drive into a parking lot and see more car tags from a native nation than my state. Um, so it was a really special place to grow up um, in terms of being indigenous, uh, but then as I entered into my entrepreneurial journey, I, and actually just my work journey, just you know, going to law school and moving around the country, I began to see that it wasn't that way in other places, um, and certainly not in the financial space that I kind of fell into a career in. Yeah. Um, I had some personal experiences trying to tackle finances as an indigenous person that were really difficult. Um, and that was the path that led me to found Totem, which is the only digital bank by and for indigenous people. So we're trying to help more of our people get banked and we're partnering with tribes to help them disperse cash benefits and payroll to uh, citizens of their nations and employees. Um, and so we're doing that to get more of our people banked, Native are the largest group of unbanked people in the country. And um, being that that's what I do, it's this really weird connection between fintech and tech in this very like sexy, fast moving world, um, but also working with tribes and indigenous communities and very underserved people, very impoverished people typically, um, if you look at the statistics. And it's really difficult to marry those two when you're trying to go out and fund a company because it's like, well, who do I talk to, <laughs> right? I had so many calls with uh, sort of institutional VC, more tech-focused folks that um, kind of understood the model but didn't understand my market. They didn't understand my market, right? Mm -hmm. um, they would have a lot of like pity calls <laughs> where they would like, I would get in the door with a big VC fund and they would have the call and it would be great and they'd be so supportive and then at the end they would always look at me and say we're really glad you're doing this but we just don't know anything about it sorry um yeah put us it. on your investor updates <laughs> you're welcome i yeah. will do that so that you can say you're on my investor updates 
Um, and it was just really difficult to go out and have those conversations over and over and over again until I found my way into impact investing. And that truly changed the game. Um, so I was introduced by another indigenous woman uh, to a group called Raven Indigenous Capital Partners. As the name implies, they are indigenous. They are primarily in Canada, but um, are deploying a lot of capital in the US now, um, more and more. And um, when I talked to them about what I was doing, they immediately understood it because this world of tribal economic development and sovereignty was not unknown to them. It was not scary to them. Sure. They were able to look past that and see the economic opportunity that others couldn't. And that was really cool because they're indigenous, so they totally, totally get it. But you know, the same is true of other impact investors because what I found is that they are willing to go out and do the legwork, right? Those other institutional VCs where I was just like, you know, great, we've got an indigenous woman in the pipeline. Yeah, um, that that was uh, that was very different than um, the people that genuinely wanted to solve our problem. It felt different. And they were willing to, you know, Norbert uh, is in the audience here somewhere today. He's with Good Chaos, and he's not even from the U.S., um, but he was on the phone to the secretary of the Muscogee Creek Nation learning about their really interesting governmental structure, learning about what challenges they're facing um, in finance and, um, you know, all of these different things to put in the work to truly understand the opportunity. And I think that's where impact investing is so important. And then something that was surprising on the journey um, was really just the thing that I want to leave with the entrepreneurs in the audience is just the importance of conversations. So even the ones that were using me to like check the box, mm -hmm. um, there's always an opportunity there to ask for another intro, ask if they know someone else who does do this work. Oftentimes they'll know someone in impact investing or philanthropy who would be interested. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll wrap up and let you like <laughs> take us wherever else we need to go, is just the importance of like being people with people. Um, so it's very easy, especially in a funder and fundy situation, to get locked into those traditional roles that put the entrepreneur oftentimes on the back foot, to be candid, especially yes. if they're an underserved you know, group or a first-time entrepreneur like myself. Um, and I think the way that we can prevent that from happening is just by building good relationship in the first place. Um, so, you know, we know each other because uh, the known holdings, but known, uh, brought me as a part of the indigenous delegation to an incredible event called SOCAP, which a lot of you would probably enjoy. And one of the things that they do there that's so cool is they talk about when you're meeting someone, um, they don't want you to talk about, I'm from the Kellogg Foundation. They want you to talk about what you're passionate about and what you're interested in and what sparks you. And so I'd say like that's really where I found common ground from investors right off the bat, and mm -hmm. then you can kind of ease into bringing them into your world. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Amber, you hit on so many of the aspects of what um, people that are outside of the nomenclature of investments, of asset allocation, of what we have to go through to be able to normalize the process for others to be able to, to find us. And um, one of the things that, it, that's one of the reasons that I started Known was having come out of 40 years of experience in that nomenclature, I know that it doesn't work to be able to discover and find different. Uh, some of the speakers yesterday had talked about um, we can't use the same tools. We can't use the, the same processes. But at the same time, there's some of them that we have to be able to utilize, that we have to be able to bring together to be able to move it forward. And then, you know, developing the ability to be able to know that difference, to know where we need to insert that there's, there's talent, there's opportunity with indigenous populations, within black and brown populations, that we have to then understand that the historical um, gates that have been put in place that have kept us from doing that. Um, one of the things that, that I'd like you to share quickly is in the relationships and in the network, and I think that there's somebody that we are both kind of involved with 
you know, how did that investment come to, to be? All of our investors came from just having conversation after conversation, and it's the same way that we built the product, to be candid. Um, we spent a long time just talking to native folks before we ever even thought about raising money to see if this was something that was important, right, to our people and it needed. Um, those conversations led, you know, you know how it goes. This is, this is like the thing that I preach on all the time. Conversations come, just keep talking to people because that one leads to the next, to the next, to the next. So um, obviously, and you guys are all familiar with this, once you have that lead investor in the door also, those conversations get a lot easier. They're sharing diligence. They're using their networks with other investors. Um, if you've got a good one, like I did, um, they're making your job as a founder easier by leveraging their own networks. Um, and so I think that that's just uh, really can't be understated how important events like this are for all of you to be in the same room and sharing deal flow and knowing what each other's missions are so that you can pass people like me along when it's like, oh no, we don't do that, but you know, Raven would be perfect for you. Um, I think that's so, so important. Um, and I would say too, like, again, just going back to being people, like our, so our first ever tribal partner that we worked with, it's really difficult to work in Indian country, really difficult to work with tribes. A lot of investors asked us like, how are you even gonna get into this? How are you even gonna break into this market? Like you're selling into government and it's tribal government? That sounds like the slowest thing ever. Um, but just by being authentic, we met our first tribal partner. I was at a dinner, he gets introduced as the treasurer of such and such nation. And, you know, we just had a good time at the dinner and became friends. And um, later on, we met for coffee, he loved the mission, whatever. But he told me months and months later after we had signed an agreement with his nation, you know, the reason why I wanted to work with you and learn more was because you didn't pitch me. Right. You didn't pitch me right. at dinner. Everyone else, as soon as they hear my title, they go into pitch mode. Right, right. That's no. the last thing you want to do, guys. Um, if you can find common ground as people, that's the best place to start. You know, one of the themes um, for the, this conference overall and, and the event overall is what actions um, can, um, can we take? And when I say we, uh, you, me, and also, um, those that have those relationships of influence or sit with, with allocators, um, what are the actions that you feel like they can, um, they can do, that they can move forward with? Go meet your local tribal nations, <laughs> please. You are on native land, I guarantee it. <laughs> no matter where you are, you're on it or you're near it, right? Um, I can't understate how, or I can't overstate how important it is to meet your local tribal leaders because not only do they have vast amounts of ancient wisdom that you may not be tapping into that is local ancient wisdom typically that is really crucial for a lot of people that are into agriculture, climate, right? Um, but they also have robust economic development engines that are working in many of these nations and it goes way beyond gaming. People automatically think of casinos but um, Tribes are doing an enormous amount of work in everything from plastic manufacturing to drones. Uh, the the in enterprises that these tribal nations have are vast. And so truly, as a business leader, you are missing out. It would be like if you had the CEO of Walmart in your town and you never went and you know, tried to set up a meeting with their team. Um, so that's what it is, in my opinion, at least. So. Well, you know, one of the things, and uh, again, I... Sometimes I try to not get up on my soapbox, but it's hard when you're on a literal like, yeah, stage. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to go ahead and, and, and hop on. You know, one of the things that we, we tend to forget, and you know, with you mentioning that we're on indigenous land, if we acknowledge that um, the United States uh, economy was developed on um, free IP, free land, um, free labor, and that the wealth that that's created, which now is at a, over the next 30 years, we're gonna transfer about $91 trillion of wealth that was created out of the foundation of a market that was based on um, the, 
non-philanthropic uh, contribution from indigenous and enslaved people. Um, that non-philanthropic, that's a lovely way to say things. <laughs> I, I'm trying to be kind. And I think that what we have to do is part of what we have to do and actionable is look at the different ways of being able to make those allocations and look at our capital stack differently because everybody wants to say, oh, it's a concessionary return, oh, it's this. But if we think about how much of our economy and how much of our opportunity has been created by doing research and development, by doing things that were not intended to create a financial return, but things that were created to produce an outcome. And so that's part of what I think that we can push with and to try to lower the obstacles of as we move from philanthropic to impact to market to um, buyout to uh, across that whole um, chasm to be able to think about it instead of in separate pools in a aligned pool to at the end of the day both have um, financial returns but also have high utility of those returns and the impact within the communities, societies that they exist. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the only way to do it. I, th I don't think there's anything concessionary at all about backing an indigenous company for indigenous people if I can get it to profitability within three years of launching, right? I mean, our model is built on payments. It is <laughs> like, I mean, it's a good business to be in, right, um, let's right, just say that. Right, and right. so uh, we're, we, what we did is we looked at the landscape, and it's really interesting in the space that we're in, digital banking, which I'll just touch on briefly. What we saw in COVID was really interesting because we needed to get a ton of money out to people very quickly. And if people didn't have a bank account, all the banks were closed, so what do you do? You have to sign up for an online account if you're not already banked. So we had a huge wave of people that all of a sudden got banked because of these digital accounts. With that, we saw a lot of digital banks pop up for all of these different groups. Black Americans, Asian Americans, immigrants, uh, you know, LGBTQIA folks, I mean, just every group that you can think of was trying to do niche banking for their community, which is noble. However, the model is wrong. Because what you're doing is you're saying, we're gonna take this model that works for Chime when you have a million people and massive scale and interchange, and we're gonna try to offer that to a much smaller percentage of the population using the same model, it just doesn't work. So what do you do? Well, you could just not serve those people at all, that would be a travesty, or you can get creative. So what we did in our case was we looked at our community and we said, okay, we wanna be able to get people banked. What does that mean? That means no fees, no overdrafts, safe, simple, straightforward accounts. If we can, we'd love to be able to send money back and forth like Venmo, right? right? How do we do that in a way that is profitable, like 10x profitable, just like every other VC expects? Just because your impact doesn't mean you don't need a return, right? right? So we said, well, let's look at the actual communities we're trying to serve. Oh, well, they have tribes, literal governments that are passing out programs, funding, all of these things that no one is serving directly. And that is a commercial product that can essentially subsidize our ability to provide those accounts to tribal members. The tribe wants it, it's good for them, it's good for us, and that's what you should be looking at as an impact investor is not concessionary in any way, but how can I look at this problem through the lived experience lens in order to create a real scalable solution? By the end user. Um, I see, I, we have one We've question. We've got a question already lined up, yeah. I do, thank you. Uh, my name is Sergio Figueroa. Um, I, I come from the world of project finance. I've been doing about 25 years or so of investing in infrastructure, energy assets uh, globally. And I'm very curious about the point around profitability that we're making specifically in indigenous nations in the US. Um, and you know, bear with me, I'm coming also from a lens of investing in Latin America and coming to my surprise, starting to focus in the US about three, four years ago, that projects in indigenous uh, communities in, in the US face a lot of problems similar to what I find in some Latin American countries, specifically with regards to what people would call sovereign type risk, right? Country type risk of sorts. 
uh, a bunch of projects that, that had come across my desk uh, failed to find financing precisely because of a perceived risk of well, what if that specific government, which is technically under US law, quasi-sovereign, mm -hmm. decides to change things. So how can I invest over a 10, 20 year period for a you know, solar generation farm? You know, a gentleman earlier made a, an example out of that. Right. Do you find that becoming a limiting factor to what you're doing specifically with your company and attracting capital? And do you see that as systematically problematic for scaling issues uh, so solutions to the issues that you're trying to tackle more well, broadly? I'll take the first part, but then I want to throw it to you okay. for the broader issue. I mean, for me, I am a Delaware C Corp public benefit corporation. So dealing with me is no different than dealing with any other fintech that a VC would want to fund. Um, we are not tribally owned. I'm a tribal member, but that has no bearing on our actual, like we're not incorporated on a tribal nation. Now, I as a business do carry some risk in contracting with a sovereign tribal government, but we just contract around those, right? Things get built all the time with tribal nations. Um, but that's where I'd like to throw it to you actually, because right. you're doing much bigger deals. So what does that look like for you? Well, no, I, I think that that's, that's part of there had never been created kind of the black, brown, indigenous equivalent of a, of a mothership like a, a Goldman Sachs or like of a Morgan Stanley or um, JP Morgan, and, and which would be able to navigate that, those types of issues and manage for the, the, that level of risk. So that's what we're, we're trying to do so that we're able to execute not only domestically um, but regionally, um, and be, because we're, we're going to need to be in South America, we're going to need to be in Central America, um, we're going to need to be in the continent, uh, continent at some point. So to be able to navigate those differences with, um, with sovereign entities and the issues and the geopolitical changes that, we, that we're going to encounter, we have to almost anticipate and expect those. And then how do we pivot and how do you navigate? So um, that's how we're approaching it and looking at it to be able to be part of that ecosystem. And we'll take Someone one more. Him. One more? Nope. Cut. Nope. We're cut, cut off. Sorry. Sorry. You can find me after I'm around. Come yeah. to my brain trust. <laughs> I, I, I think we're doing a little networking afterwards, but yeah. we're going to go. We're going to go. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>